I'm librarian Yamila Alkayat, and this is NNLM Discovery, a podcast from the Network of the National Library of Medicine. This podcast series explores how the NNLM is engaging with communities to provide access to trusted information for the purpose of improving the public's health. On our final episode of season one, we've decided to showcase another podcast series that's being produced at the National Institutes of Health. The podcast is called Speaking of Science, and it is produced and hosted by Diego Arenas, a health communication specialist working to promote the NIH Intramural Research Program. Diego's here with me today. Hi, Diego. Hi, Yamila. In our previous episode, we featured an intramural researcher at the National Library of Medicine studying artificial intelligence, Dr. Samir Antani. So the NLM has its own intramural research program, but what is the NIH intramural research program and what is its relation to NLM? Great question. Many people might not know that the NIH doesn't just award grants for extramural research happening all around the country. It also boasts thousands of scientists conducting their own research inside the so-called four walls of the NIH, hence intramural. The National Library of Medicine has its own intramural research program, just like the other 26 institutes and centers that make up the NIH. Each institute, like NLM, creates its own research agenda and its own budget. But collectively, we refer to all these programs together as the Intramural Research Program, or IRP for short. And I'm part of a team that showcases all the great research coming out of the IRP. And the NIH IRP started a podcast called Speaking of Science. Tell me about this podcast. Yes, we launched the podcast in 2019, and it's been a great way to profile IRP researchers and share their findings with the community. There's a lot happening at NIH all the time. We have over 1,100 principal investigators and 4,000 postdoctoral fellows conducting research, which actually makes the IRP the largest biomedical research institution in the world. So, Speaking of Science created a podcast episode featuring an NLM researcher. I invited you on today to walk us through and share some clips from this episode. Sure thing. The episode you're talking about features Dr. Lauren Porter, and it is called Molecular Transformers. Um, Transformers like the cartoon robots? Yes, exactly. Dr. Porter is helping redefine the way we understand how proteins behave. So it's been a while since I reviewed this. Can you give us the basics on protein function before jumping into Dr. Porter's research? Sure. So proteins are basically large, complex molecules that play many critical roles in the body. They do most of the work in cells and are required for structure, function, and regulation of the body's tissues and organs. Proteins are made up of hundreds or thousands of smaller units called amino acids, which are attached to one another in long chains. I'm having flashbacks to my high school science class. I remember the amino acids help determine the functionality of the protein. You're right. The sequence of amino acids is unique to each protein and dictates how it will arrange itself in three-dimensional space. The resulting structure, or conformation, is what then gives a protein its function inside the cell. Most proteins only adopt one conformation. Well, that is until they don't. Here's Dr. Porter explaining more. It turns out that there is this emerging class of proteins called fold switching proteins, which can actually change their folds and their functions in response to cellular stimuli. This would be as if your kitchen blender could all of a sudden turn into a toaster with the flip of a switch. The first time I saw that, I was like, whoa. There is some stuff we do not understand about proteins because based on everything I've learned, that should not be possible. Fold switching proteins are reminiscent of transformers. You know, those huge alien robots from comic books and movies that can change from one machine into another at the drop of a dime. My name is Optimus Prime. We are autonomous robotic organisms from the planet Cybertron. The Analogy with Optimus Prime is good, because in one case, he's a robot, and in another case, he's a car. And you would never know that the robot could become a car, or vice versa, just by looking at it. So some of these proteins really can shift completely, and you would never know just by looking at it. How different are these changes? I mean, are we talking small differences, like 
a car to like a truck or something more stark like a car to a, a helicopter? We're talking like a car to an elephant. It's a complete different change. So a car to an elephant, that's a big change. And what's the importance of understanding these switches? It's huge. Understanding how even the smallest switch occurs could help scientists understand the molecular basis of certain diseases like cancer, autoimmune disorders, and bacterial and viral infections. And how is this being done? Well, proteins exhibit two main amino acid arrangements, alpha helices, which look like springs, or beta pleated sheets, which kind of look like a, a woven fabric. But both types of fold patterns are energetically stable, which makes them pretty rigid. So a switch from one to the other is very surprising to see. Here's Dr. Porter talking about how they're studying these switches. And what my lab is looking for right now are examples of proteins that switch from alpha helix to beta sheet, because those are like the most drastic changes one can imagine. And so, they are probably the easiest to find. Right now, we use machine learning-based methods um, that classify um, secondary structures of proteins. And what we look for are when we change things about the sequence, like we shorten it um, or something like that, does the secondary structure prediction change or does it stay the same? And when we see substantial changes to secondary structure by altering the context of the sequence, that to us is a strong indicator that this protein might switch folds. And what triggers those folds to switch from one state to another? Is it something in the environment? So it depends. Certain fold switching proteins actually sample both conformations at the same time, but there are other proteins that do need to be triggered. And there are a number of different triggers. So um, changes in pH, binding of protein, changes in redox potential, any of those things and many more can trigger the fold switching. In our Speaking of Science episode, we do go into greater detail about how this research is carried out and how it fits into the ultimate mission of improving human health. But Dr. Porter's research is really changing the way we think of something that we thought was fully understood for so long. For sure, I'm definitely comfortable saying that fold switching proteins show that there's some stuff we don't understand. And it's important to understand it, especially because of how relevant towards integral biological processes. Um, we recently wrote a paper um, basically showing that fold switching seems like a specific mechanism of regulation. And being able to respond to the environment quickly is a much more effective way of, of regulation than, for example, conditions change and now a whole new protein needs to be expressed. The time scale on just switching a fold is a lot faster than on transcribing and on translating a new protein. Beyond understanding the dynamics of these fold switching proteins, what is the goal when it comes to implications in human health? I know they're kind of integral in some diseases. Yeah, so I think the first thing is we got to understand the biophysics of these proteins, like the dynamics and how they work. If we can get a better handle on that, my hope is down the road, therapeutics could be developed that target fold switching proteins and force them to stay in one conformation or favor one conformation. So like, for example, the protein we study called RFAH regulates the expression of virulence genes in proteins like E. coli. On a basic level, what that means is RFAH plays an integral role of giving people food poisoning. And so if it were possible to um, force RFAH to not be able to switch between its two folds, that could dramatically um, reduce the amount of virulence proteins that um, bacteria could produce. Oh, and, and effectively lowering the likelihood of getting food poisoning. Yeah. Um, so it may be possible down the road to produce drugs that target these. On the flip side, um, a kind of tantalizing study in um, Journal of Molecular Biology came out a couple years ago showing that 
amino acid change associated with um, a certain form of human cancer switched a secondary structure element in a human protein from an alpha helix to a beta sheet. And so it could be possible perhaps to design some sort of therapeutic that targets that protein, you know, that has that amino acid change so that maybe it could be restored to its native form. And then maybe that would help, you know, decrease the number of cancer cells that could grow or something. So um, I think those are kind of the two ways that I imagine, you know, decades down the road, this research being useful um, in the clinic. And I hope to see that in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, well, that's what I think is so great about basic science. Yes, there's the thrill of discovering something new and the curiosity to really understand it at a fundamental level. But I think it also feeds into like the scientific imagination. You know what I mean? Um, like it, it kind of opens the mind to a new world of possibilities, especially ones that can make an impact on a lot of people's lives. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, I don't think I could have pursued this without knowing that this really could make an impact downstream. When I was a junior in college, my dad got diagnosed with stage four cancer mm. and seeing how much he had to suffer to survive, like he had to have, you know, multiple rounds of chemo. He had a bone marrow transplant um, and it, it, it was really, really hard. Um, for him and for us as a family to watch. And so I remember thinking like, well, you know, I would love to do something so that, you know, down the road, someone like me doesn't have to watch their parents suffer and their parent doesn't have yeah. to go through the suffering. And so that really um, helps me stay motivated. Diego, thanks for sharing this story on our NLM researcher, Dr. Lauren Porter. It's research like this that may change the future of science. I think you're definitely right. The power of the NIH IRP is that we're really thinking outside of the box and trying to reshape scientific thinking. We've included a link to the full episode of this Speaking of Science podcast, plus a short video about Dr. Lauren Porter's research in our show notes. Diego, thanks for coming in and having a little NIH podcast synergy with us. Of course, and congrats on your first season. I look forward to listening to season two. Thank you. NNLM Discovery will return soon with new episodes. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us online. And remember to rate, share, and comment on our show wherever you get your podcasts. This is NNLM Discovery.